week to you all. Thank you for joining our panel discussion on kickstarting your career as a 3D freelancer. I'm Jennifer Waters, Industry Marketing at Autodesk, and today I am joined by Higgins Alas, our Community Engagement at Autodesk, who will be moderating the chat, the Rookies co-founder, Alwyn Hunt, and five talented artists who have worked as a freelancer. And now I'll introduce our panelists in a moment, but before we get started, I wanted to let everyone in the audience know that we are here for you. So please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Our panelists will be happy to answer them live or in the chat box. So keep in mind that like many of you, most of us are working from home with our kids, our cats, our dogs. So please bear with us if there are any technical difficulties, random doorbells, or any weird background noises. I'd also like to remind you about our indie offerings. So starting out in a business uh, can be tough, uh, including on your budget. So while you're getting started and building your freelance career, take advantage of 3ds Max and Maya for indie users. You can get full Maya or 3ds Max at an affordable price. Uh, Hagen will be posting the link to the chat so you can check it out and see if you're eligible. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce our panelists today. So first up, we have our animation expert, Robin Daly, also known as Robin O in South Africa. We are also joined by Shailene Hilbert, our 3D character artist in the UK. We have Sarah Mukimani, our experienced professional 3D architectural visualizer. Bolash Domian, a freelance 3D artist currently in the Netherlands. And Justin Woolman, game, develop game development learning producer at the game. In the US. So, as you can imagine, we have a lot to cover and a lot to learn from our experts. So, let's get started. So, I think we can begin with a quick round of introductions. Can each of you tell us about your work, um, your background, and talk about the journey of how you got started on your own? Let's start with uh, Robin. Um, so I'm a 3D animator and a journalist as well, and I also do some motion graphics design. I started in the industry about 10 years ago, that's when I graduated from college. I studied animation and new media at college. And um, when I first went into the industry, it was very difficult to find work at all. So I started as a freelancer, and on the side I also supplemented by doing temping and stuff like that just to get by. So I freelanced for quite a few years. Um, presently, at the moment now, I'm a head of department at a media company for animation and vision effects, but I do work very closely with freelancers still, so I've got a lot of that experience as both a freelancer and working with and hiring freelancers as well. Awesome. Shailene? Um, hi, I'm a 3D characterized for video games. Um, I've been working in the industry for six and a half years now. Three and a half have been in um, freelancing and being self-employed, working for indie studios or outsource studios um, and like double A studios as well. Um, I got into <laughs> freelancing um, mainly because I had friends who did it also and the kind of uh, structure of your day and being able to work on many projects really appealed to me. So I joined, um, I started saving up money for about six months while working full time in the studio before then being made redundant and then leaving to go freelance full time. <laughs> Sarah? I'm a 3D architecture visualizer with a background of interior design. After graduating from university studying computer science, I found that my true passion was in interior design. And I realized that the best way to show your creativity to people is learning 3D software such as AutoCAD and 3D Max. So I started learning about these softwares and now visualization is my passion because it's given me this opportunity to work uh, with many different fields. And uh, I started freelancing um, because um, I needed uh, to have a more flexible schedule, more free time to balance life at home with work. 
Uh, as a freelancer, you can be your boss and dictate how you work based on your schedule. And um, despite starting to work as a full-time employee, I kept my uh, freelance job on the side because I didn't want to lose my well-earned clients. It's definitely manageable and can be balanced by organizing your schedule. Great, Balash. Uh, hi. So I'm a, I'm a 3D artist. If I need to put myself in a, uh, in a category, I would say 3D environment slash uh, asset artist. And uh, so far, I think I'm, uh, I'm the youngest here when it comes to industry experience. I think even I can, I'm still considered a rookie <laughs> by, the, by the rookie standard because I, uh, I still don't have a one year long experience in the industry. I started working uh, professionally last year in uh, July, July 15th. And uh, it was actually a full time, full time job at Guerrilla. And uh, I only left uh, about a month ago or a month and a half ago, a month ago. And uh, since then I've been freelancing, but I also had uh, a couple of uh, freelance uh, gigs while I was working there. But now, um, so my, my situation is a bit different because uh, I left a bit earlier. My contract uh, would have ended soon anyways, but I left a bit earlier. And uh, I already have uh, another um, full-time job online, but uh, I still need to wait until this current worldwide situation that uh, you know I just don't want to mention uh, eases up a little. And in the meantime, uh, I'm going to be freelancing so this is this is uh, this is how it happened, and yeah, we can we can dive into details later <laughs> and let the others introduce themselves. Thank you, and last but not least, Justin. Hey guys, and uh, so my name's Justin. I'm in located in Chicago, but I've been working uh, in the industry for almost twenty years. So I think I'm on the older side. Um, I started off like i feel like everyone where i wanted to get a full-time job and just stay at that full-time job because i wanted the job security and i worked at a bunch of studios and i was teaching on the side and i just kept on getting these little like random like contract gigs popping up as well and i'd find myself at these studios and i'd, I'd get a lot of work but sometimes there'd be like these lulls where i was just super bored but i wasn't really allowed to work on other things while i was at the studios so about <clears throat> five years ago uh, when I had like around 15 years experience, I started to really like play with the idea of like, all right, look, I'm just going to do nothing but contract work, um, which is, a, it, it was a shift um, because obviously at a certain point you're taking a risk from that full time being in the studio. But then I was able to juggle a bunch of different gigs, especially um, where I was able to get contracts that allowed me to work on multiple studios um, and not really having it interfere. And then I can do things like my main trade, I guess, what I always did was environment art. Uh, and then I like went up to like lead and art director and um, creative director. And lately I've been at um, Epic um, as a producer for their game development content. But before then um, I was working at like a bunch of different studios. But even when I first started at like Epic, I'm still technically contracting with them. And I'm working with people like the rookies. I'm doing stuff with heavy metal. I'm doing like lots of different things. and. I think the main reason I want to start to do it because I met a couple friends, which is ironically how I met Alan through um, these friends. And I just wanted to travel more. And I, my main mistake being an artist, I wanted to really, before I got like older and couldn't do it, or before there was like lockdowns, I wanted to be able to like travel, see different countries see different cultures and really absorb that. And I feel like it's made me uh, a better developer, a better creative because I've been able to, you know, like there's something about getting out of your country, your routine that allows you to like really appreciate other architecture aspects, other visual aspects, problem solving. Um, and it's also, it's, it becomes kind of a rush to like juggle all these different things. And like most people, it's very hard for me to want to work as a creative nine to five sometimes or like 10 to six. So like as a contractor, I kind of make my own hours and I would be like, all right, I feel like working on this today, not that. 
So yeah, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Um, so I wanted to ask you all, how, when you got started, how did you learn the business side of freelancing? Because I mean, I know, you know, coming out of school or even getting off a, a stable regular job, it, it could be daunting, like learning the business side. How do you invoice? And um, how did you get to learn those skills? Did you take a business class or was it self-taught? Self-taught. And if I'm being completely honest, I've been audited twice by the IRS. Um, and that's not fun, but it, it's something that like, I didn't realize, I thought it, like the more I kept on getting gigs, the more I started shifting from a W2 in the um, United States to like more 1099s. And I started like getting jobs in different countries. And when it came to like tax time, I would always just be like, eh, I can do my own taxes. But then there was a point in like 2013 where I started doing my taxes. And I didn't, I, you know, you, you think you understand what you can write off, what you can't write off, how to itemize, how to specialize things. And you don't. And then that, at that point, I was like, all right, I need to really invest in an accountant. I got audited twice, which sucked. But it also was a huge learning experience. And it taught me how I can be better with my funds, um, like getting like setting up um, American, Ex like I, I use American Express business. I'm not like saying you should do this, but that MX business is where I then any, like I have a Autodesk Indie license. I have my Adobe, everything else that goes to that. I have any, if I do a travel, if I'm doing something with the rookies or with Epic and I travel someplace, I use that for my meals, for my hotel, for my flights. And then when I'm doing my end of the year stuff, it's easier to break down, see what my expenses are. But that also helps me determine on top of that, how much should I be charging for an event? Is this something that's worth my while? How is it going to benefit me? But it was, I would say I mean, everything I've ever done, There's, I've never read a book. It's just been like, you react to it, then you find out the, what you should and shouldn't do. And then now I'm like, all right, cool. I'm very, very aware of what I cannot do to get audited again. So that's good. Does anyone else want to weigh in on how they taught themselves the business side of things? Mm, for me, first time invoicing was based on Google search and asking some of my coworkers. And after that, um, it was kind of like simple format. But after that, after I registered my corporate, it changed to something more professional and talking with my accountant to taking care, care of taxes and everything else. Um, I guess in the UK, I'm not sure how it is in other countries, but you don't necessarily have to be a company. Um, a lot of freelancers here are just under um, self-assessment. Um, so I'm not actually a company. I don't have a company address or anything like that or a company bank account. I just use a current account. Um, but I think the best thing really is to build a network of other freelancers. Like I have a huge list on my Twitter of other 3D freelancers where I kind of collect them all and um, you end up then getting to know other people, what they do. I've had people send me like their tax Google sheets of how they break that down for themselves or like their own invoice formats or standardized contracts that they send clients who don't have contracts themselves. Um, we share a lot of information between each other. So Google, when I Google search things, you get like a very generic breakdown of this is how you invoice something, but it's very different for the types of companies that you're working with and what information they want from you. Um, so I think the most beneficial thing is just to get to know other freelancers and then definitely invest in an accountant because it is a taxable uh, deductible from your profit. So even though it may be like 400 pounds for two hours of their time, you get to, to get that back off your taxes and profits. So it is an investment, but it also helps you to bring your profits down, which then means you pay less tax as well. So my accountant taught me a lot of things. She wants to empower me to be able to do it myself. Um, so I think it's definitely worth finding somebody who can help to teach you those things um, and then just build a network with other people. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, oh gosh, I wanted to ask you this question because I know, you know, it's pretty recent for you. Do you have any advice for people just starting out? 
Yeah, so for me it's still relatively new and uh, to be honest the first freelance gig uh, that happened that was oh, somewhere around a year ago. That was that was a very short work. It took me only two or three days and I got paid two hundred dollars. Um, and in terms of like any legal activities I or, or taxation, I didn't I didn't do anything. <laughs> I didn't do anything at that time. Even when they were asking for an invoice, uh, I had to ask them like, uh, "Hey, I, I've never, I've never done this. Do you have uh, like any advice? Like, how can I, how can I generate invoice, or how you generally, uh, how you generally do this with your clients?" And they just showed me uh, a website online. It's like an invoice generator or something. I don't even remember, but there you can, like, anyone can create an invoice. And uh, the most recent thing that's. Uh, uh, already in progress. That's uh, that's gonna happen differently. So I'm not paid by hour, but uh, once the project is done, I'm gonna be paid in a certain percentage after uh, after the sales. That's gonna that's gonna happen, and uh, the percentage itself is gonna be determined um, in terms of how much I'm gonna actually contribute to the project overall. But there is a there is a certain amount, certain sum that uh, anyone can earn here in the Netherlands, which uh, after which you don't have to pay taxes. It's, it's uh, I think it's a couple of thousand euros. I'm not I'm not uh, completely sure about the numbers, so I, I don't I don't want to say anything about that. But uh, this is this is something that I still need to dive in into a, a little bit uh, more in detail but since uh, no payments gonna happen in like three months from now because that's the deadline that we set for our project uh, until that time like that that's, that's the time that i still have <laughs> in order to figure everything out so i know it's, it's not too much that i can uh, provide you with <laughs> on this on this topic but I, I hope that uh, even this uh, this uh, tiny bit of info uh, can also be still useful for someone out there. Thank you. I'm just gonna just to quickly add to that, if I can. Um, you know, and you you know, when, when you when you get into these various industries as well, you know, and you start traveling, like every country is different, right? And and Justin, who has been, you know, audited a couple of times, and that's just in the States, right? I've worked in the States as well, and it's like, the, you, I can't stress enough. Like, sometimes you're like, oh, you skimp out on, on trying to get a good accountant because it's, they're expensive or whatever, but they will pay them pay for themselves 10 times back um, if you get a good accountant. And, you know, first and foremost, if you're going freelance, that would be my number one priority is getting a good accountant. First and foremost, yeah, because uh, honestly, like, um, it's a, like I think I heard it be some new talk about like invoice generator. Like, you'll you'll find once you get that accountant, you become more aware. Like, I break down, I have my accountant, but I still break down everything I'm doing. The reason why I'm doing that is because um, I have an LLC, but I have an S corp, which means that in the state of Illinois, uh, LLC is kind of like prevents me. It's a limited limited liability corporation, but S corp allows me to hire. If I get a freelance gig, I can hire someone to help me with those freelance gigs and I can pay them out. Now, I don't have to, and this is, again, different in every single state. Like if I get a gig and it's less than $500, I don't have to really report that because I don't have to pay taxes on it to that capacity. So, and then when I'm doing gigs for people who are less than $500, they won't actually give me a 1099 because I don't need it because they can do, I forgot what number is, usually it's 500. Um, but I keep that in mind when I'm doing freelance too. If I need to hire someone, I'm like, eh, I'll just give someone like it's a smaller gig. But um, I use this this tool called Hello Bonsai. Again, it works for me, works for whoever else. But I like it because it's made me more professional. There's a spreadsheet in the back of it. It auto generates um, contracts. It has all these different things you can kind of deal with it. There's a good tracking thing. It sends reminders, so I don't have to. So that way, people take me seriously because when I'm doing my free my contract stuff. Um, unless it's like a signed contract where I have like years of work and I'm always getting paid a set time, I ask for half up front and then half upon completion. And I give them clear guidelines of what 
I'm doing in all this. Cause I think that's the biggest thing when you're a freelancer, there has to be some sort of like bullet point, um, like description of, Hey, clearly stating what you are doing for them when you're delivering it. And cause the, the trap that a lot of people are going to get into when they're doing freelance is people wanting iterations or changings changes. And they want it to be covered underneath that initial payment. It's like, then they're taking advantage of you. And then also the question is, if someone goes up to you, what, what, what's your, what's your rate? Most people don't know their rates. Um, and the easiest way to kind of break down your rates, like some people will have, like, they'll ask for day rates or they'll ask for like hourly rates. You just need to start doing your research and sort of like break up back from there. But yeah, you definitely need a good accountant. Like I don't, I've had mine for like uh, eight years now. It's a breeze. It's like clockwork now. I don't have to worry about anything. So you heard them get an accountant. <laughs> and one, one that is uh, preferably knowledgeable in your industry as well. And, and like just, uh, Justin said, you know, do, do, you know, through friends and networking stuff, try and find somebody that is, yeah, that, that knows about the industry and can get those tax breaks, you know, with, with the sort of stuff that we do. Yeah, ideally that same person might actually have um, I got lucky. Mine has a legal team attached to it as well. So that if I ever need to have a lawyer, I have that attached to them. And it's usually tax law or like accounting law or all those other fun things. Yeah, the boring stuff that you want to know. <laughs> it's important. So before we talk about getting an accountant, we need clients. <laughs> so I want to ask you all, how, how do you go about self-promoting? How do you get your clients? What are the best ways that you've found have worked for you? I'll turn real quick. Uh, you just have to be reliable. Like the biggest thing that you can control is who you are, your brand. And it's not necessarily how good you are initially. It's just, it's just like if Alan reaches out to me, He's like, I know Justin's going to respond. I know he's going to do this. He always has. So that way, if someone is asking Alan for a gig and he needs someone that's in North America, he needs someone that does game dev, he's like, who do I know? All right, Justin is reliable and will respond and he does good work. Um, so oftentimes it is your network and oftentimes it's you establishing yourself that you are reliable, that you do the work and you're easy to work with. Because being freelance, I think that's, and I have a lot of students and a lot of other people asking like, you know, now that everything's like post lockdown times and current lockdown times, how do I do remote work? How do I do contract work? Especially if they don't know you, you have to show that you're a reliable person. And you can do that through your own network, whether it's peers, people that you're in school with, instructors, people that you're doing current gigs with, or even just your portfolio. Because what do we do if someone offers you a job? You go to their website and if the website's all shoddy looking and doesn't look like it's cohesive and it looks like it's made in like the 90s or it doesn't exist, it seems shady, right? So if you establish yourself well as a brand and you have good examples of your work, maybe some testimonials and you have that good network already going, that's huge. Yeah, I guess for people who are more who have less experience because obviously I started freelancing with only two and a half years um for me I've always kind of thought it's all to be honest it's all about right place right time um very rarely do I see people post actual listings saying I'm looking for a contractor or a freelancer usually they just go searching and they'll email people so I try to make sure that I'm just in every possible place so then it's just down to time people will then start contacting you and getting in, uh, getting in touch. Um, like I'll go to a lot of local events. Um, I like to be one of the few people locally that people know are contracting and does that one thing. So if they think we need this, hopefully I'll be one of the first people that they think of. Um, ArtStation for me is a really good one. As long as you're filling your tags on every post with like freelance, contractor, everything to do with your job, not just the piece that you've actually made, because people will go to that website and just go freelance artist and try to find people. Um, and being really active, again, with other freelancers, I think is really important, because if I can't take work, I will send it to other people that I know and make sure that they have access to that information. And it will often be people that I know on a professional level or a personal level who are capable 
Um, so I think it's really important to just make sure you're in every possible place that's relevant to your industry and be active and talk to other people who are also freelancing and get to know them on less of just an acquaintance level or like you want something from them, like building an actual like friendship rather than like a network, um, I think is really important. Um, but yeah, for me being online, um, was really beneficial for me. So when I finally said I'm freelancing now, people from an outsource studio were like, well, we've been following your content for years and we really like it. So why don't you come work with us? And then a lot of my really big AAA contracts came from that relationship. So I think just being online and not just like pumping out content, but just getting to know people and making sure your work is everywhere is really important. Uh, and I don't know maybe if I can chime in. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so I completely agree. I just I just wanted to uh, reiterate and uh, add uh, a little bit more to this uh, concept of networking because this is how everything happened to me. For, uh, to be honest, when I started out, uh, when I started my journey in three D, I was just still a student and. Uh, I was I was studying at at home and uh, doing online courses and uh, this was the case for like two years, well one and a half two years, but uh, I be I was very very active online, especially on Discord in a couple of Discord servers and Discord communities, and there were there are like thousands of people there. Also, not not only people from the industry but also a lot of students who want to get their feet into the into the industry. And uh, it was just, I, I don't even know how to explain. It's just absolutely priceless. Just uh, being, just lurking around those servers and uh, joining the conversations. I was always posting my work all the time. People were completely, um, uh, people were completely being updated about my progress. So a lot of people, uh, um, uh, had like they uh, followed my journey. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. They followed my journey, and uh, by the time I managed to publish my final work, which uh, is the same that I uh, entered uh, entered the rookies with, they knew what I was capable of. They knew that uh, I. Uh, I was I was hardworking and uh, they just they just knew that I was reliable and and everything they just they just knew me and uh, this is the this is the journey of basically you're uh, building up your personal quote unquote brand just like on, online online persona kinda and uh, yeah online online presence is just absolutely vital in my opinion because when I when I the moment I published that scene, like a ton of ton of email uh, arrived in my mailbox with uh, freelance uh, gigs and offers, and uh, the the ones that I actually accepted were from all the, from those people who I also got to know uh, on Discord. So I already know all those people who actually hired me later on, and this is, uh, yeah, this 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 uh, this is just how it happened. It's just all the power of being active online and having an online presence and networking with others. <laughs> yeah, I was I was actually going to mention I forgot to say that you guys are you're talking about work. We I did a, a webinar uh, like the other week ago with some people from the school I work with, CG Spectrum, and we were talking about how they were talking about how they sell their content on like the marketplace and other assets and how them just sharing their content and actually selling their content on there has gotten them loads of, of contract work. Um, so I would look at things like, you know, on the marketplace, I know there's like Turbo Squid, there's like a bunch of different places where you can share your work because more often than not, a lot of these studios are actually going to buy those packages and they're going to be like, they're going to see your name. They're going to recognize that quality. And over time, they might start contacting you directly to do contract work or source you out. So um, if you're making these portfolio scenes, you might as well like make sure they're nicely packaged and created. Then 
throw them up on one of those marketplaces to make an extra dime, which might actually get people looking at your work. Cause that's the nice thing too. Like as, when I'm trying to hire someone, I ultimately want to be able to like crack open their files and see what they're doing, but you can't really do that when you're looking at portfolios. Most of the time, a lot of people don't even have their breakdowns or like the reference or how they did the process on there. That's something that me and Alan always like, we'll look at when we're getting like, whether it's for weekly drills or like uh, rookie submissions is like, all right, this is a great final product, but I have no idea how you got here. I have no idea what your wireframe, your UV. I, I don't know if you're like someone who's an organized, like would I actually like working with your files? And that's huge when it comes to freelance because ultimately you're not next to me. Most of the time, if it's remote, I mean, you could be on site, but it's like, I have to take your files. And if it's a clean file that the communication and the work stuff is like, it speeds everything up so much. So if you're able to take that portfolio piece, put it up on like, you know, a marketplace to sell, make some money from it and actually have people cracking it open, being like, wow, they did such a good, how did they make that? They're going to contact you and then they're, it's going to lead to more work. And then you're still going to be getting that money from that residual content of selling your work too. Yeah, I completely agree with all of you. The first thing when I started was thinking that uh, knowledge is very important. Try to learn every day and try to be the best version of yourself. And the, because in this industry, every day we have a lot of updates. So you need to learn every day, even something very small. And then uh, having a very great portfolio that represent all of the knowledge that you have is the key. Also making connection in LinkedIn because it's so important that having a lot of connection, you can find a lot of people, company that working in this field. So you can make connection, send your portfolio and show yourself, show your talents. And also there are a lot of kind of websites like Behance, CG Architect, and you can have portfolio and you can make connection there, show your portfolio. So when, uh, when you start uh, working in this industry, having some clients and have a, with uh, having a very good quality of work, always client introduce you with the, uh, to the other people and uh, with, with that being said, you, you're going to have a lot of clients around and with time management, you can handle all of them. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add to a point you just said then, Sarah, which is, you know, like being completely honest and being a good person and offering a good service. Well, you know, and there's been a few questions in the chat in, in regards to how do you manage to juggle all your work, you know, when you're taking on multiple contracts. I think, you know, you know, from personal experience, when you're first starting out, you you um, you can be guilty of do, taking on too much work and, and really diluting the quality of your work. So, you know, I think uh, my bit of advice would be to, to really try and manage that and, and actually, because at the start, you're really setting the standards of your brand, who you are, how good your work is, your, your, your reputation essentially in the industry. So, um, don't be tempted to take on too much work just for the sake of the money. I think you know, set, set those standards up, set those standards nicely at the start, and people mm -hmm. will keep coming back to you because they know that you do good work. And exactly. you know, if you're a good person, you know, even if you can't accept that job at that point, the being a good person and being able to communicate with somebody during a job is is one is 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 fundamental. If you if you you could be a great artist but not be able to communicate the message and be able to articulate, you know, the the, the feedback and, and take that constructively. So there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics going on in freelancing that um, but I think it's crucial to be able to set that up from the start. Uh, yeah, that, that quality over quantity, because um, I'm guilty, like what Alan just said, I, I've gotten excited and I've like, you'll have sometimes like when it rains, it pours, or sometimes you'll have no gigs. And then you might keep committing to all these gigs because you're like, oh, no, what happens if I don't have any work for a long time? So you kind of like, it's a gamble. Um, like the gamble of freelancing is that you're kind of always on the reward is you make your own hours, you work on multiple projects, you get more flexibility, but the gamble is that you have to kind of like 
You need to keep your skills up. You need to be maintaining your context. You need to make sure that you're sharing your work. You need to make sure that um, the work that you are doing, because if you do a good contract, it doesn't have to be a contract. It can lead into more and more work. When I was working for Disney, it started as a contract, then it led into full time. When I was working for Epic, now it started with contract, now it led into full time. Like if you do your contracts the right way, it can lead to full time work. But also, um, I mean, it's it's not a huge like as much, as big as this industry is. It's not a big industry. So if you become that person, that's like, oh, this person is a go to. They did great work. That studio may be using you, or the person who was your contact at that studio might jump to another studio. They might be like, hey, we have bigger budgets. We have a bigger team. We want to use you for this. And then the other thing is um, a great way to keep your freelance stuff alive is to pass the work out. I think one of you were talking about this is to build your uh, your, your your networking, uh, like your, your freelancing group. Because if you can't take a gig, you pass it to someone that you trust that can take the gig. And that makes you look good because that, that employer is like, well, you help them fill that spot that they need. This happened just recently with me. I had a buddy of mine um, uh, that he reached out. We haven't talked for like four years. And I sent, uh, not only I sent an outsourced stunt company his way, but I also sent a former student his way and that they filled their position. So it makes me look good, which is not like the main effect, but like I'm able to help them. And in retrospect, it's just like it, there's, there's so much behind the scenes of like that connection. So like it, just because you can't do a gig doesn't mean you helping them find fill that spot isn't going to help you down the road as well. I love the idea behind that. I think that a common refrain that we're finding is uh, you're only as strong as your network. And uh, I find that very true. Um, going to the questions in the chat, I see one. Um, I'm studying industrial design at university. How can I use my design knowledge and use a degree that's not explicitly a 3D degree to get into 3D freelance work? I have to admit it. Uh, so what I would do is um, you need to find a need. Um, I think every single industry has like an opening of what they're not doing, um, especially with like something that is when it comes to industrial design or 3D freelance work, it's still new to people like using certain tools to enhance their work. Like, so if you're using, you know, I use Maya and all that stuff for everything from a modeling stuff, but I'll probably go in and use Adobe products to make it look pretty with substance. And then I'll go back in and I'll put it inside of like Unreal to render it. So if you can kind of find a way to, to take different softwares and have them work together, but then also per showcase it in a way that they're not used to, um, I think that was a huge thing we started seeing, like obviously like sneakers and product design just in general, transitioning from more of a 2D based industry to 3D and actually being able to rotate and zoom in and seeing the, the difference. So if I was doing that, you have to kind of you have to kind of take a step out and think outside the box. But also as a what I would highly suggest being from the gaming industry specifically, if you're doing industrial design, take some hints from other industries. Look at what the gaming industry is doing and think about how you can take that industrial design. How can you make it a little more interactive, a little prettier looking, something that's more approachable, doesn't have to be super technical based. And if you can show them like, hey, you're doing it this way, you're using like AutoCAD and Rivet and all this other stuff. What if you tried using this software to showcase the exact same thing? Show them a solution they possibly haven't thought about yet. And that's gotten me some freelance gigs. Like I've done stuff for museums. I've done stuff for medical companies. I didn't think I was going to, it was just, I did a little test and I showed them, hey, what if you did it this way? And then it led to more work. The pro is those studios, those industries usually don't know what your value is and they tend to throw more money at you um, because they don't know like, oh, they have no idea what you're doing. So it's so foreign to them that they're willing to pay even more if you're driven by money. Right. Um, Sarah, do you have any input on that since it's kind of in your wheelhouse of industrial design and rendering? Uh, so when I uh, when I started the uh, School of Interior Design uh, at the school, we learned a uh, little bit basic of AutoCAD and uh, SketchUp, and a little bit of 3D Max because uh, SketchUp is kind of like more accessible for the students. So after finishing school, I realized that so I need to have more knowledge, especially in 3D Max, because it's uh, absolutely a strong uh, 3D software uh, for the, the 
animation and visualization in terms of like having uh, because it's physical based so i started learning more about 3ds max and beside of that i learned a lot about different engine uh, like v-ray corona fstorm and any other things after that i started learning about animation with animation i needed to learn about adobe software so uh, but i'm trying to say that when you start uh, when you when you're uh, at a school and learning something uh, after graduation you're gonna find that which type of the work and like field you want to continue and based on that you can learn more about the software related to that and it's gonna start learning uh, with the basic knowledge that you learn at the school with the software that they're teaching and after that you can learn more about that yeah i really appreciate that i feel like when after i graduated sure the school gave me a lot of tools and um on hand knowledge but there was a reorientation period after graduation mm. um and and actually getting into the industry is very different so i appreciate that you kind of took your skills and said, okay, how do I apply this to the industry that I actually want to be in and, and kept on learning because school is only <laughs> the first step of, of, of learning. Exactly. Um, we have another question here. Um, do you have any thoughts on a degree versus self-taught? I am self-taught and have some concerns. Is it good? Is a good portfolio enough to get a good job? Uh, I guess I kind of want to pitch in because I'm both. Um, I went to university in Leicester, which was a game art course, but I was probably either the most below average or worst student ever. I never did the 3D courses. I never did the assignments. I barely passed them. I had no interest in them whatsoever. And it wasn't until I graduated that I realized that 3D could actually be fun when you're not just making like trash cans for three years in a row. Um, so I then, when I got my first job, which is more of a general position, and they really liked my 2D skills and my design skills more than like my 3D capabilities, which were incredibly basic at the time. Um, I then took that time to start teaching myself about the character art pipelines, 3D pipelines for games, um, and spent the two and a half years really drilling that in and learning myself and meeting people online and getting feedback from peers. Um, and when I started going freelance, the thing that I find really exciting is that you can call yourself whatever you want, right? I didn't have any character art experience, but I started calling myself one. I had a character art portfolio, and then I started getting character art jobs. And the only thing that I would say are the benefits of working in a degree is, do you have uh, the discipline to be able to teach yourself and do you have the drive to be able to teach yourself and to seek out peers for feedback and if not then going to a university that means that you create you have peers you have people you can create a community with and build a network with and support each other and also an environment where learning is actually supported um, there's a lot of self-learning that has to happen when you're at university anyway but having an environment and people to do that with and grow with is really good for people who may struggle to have focus. Um, and a degree is incredibly helpful if you want to work internationally, um, if you want visas and things like that, if you want to work on a contract for a year with an international company where they want you to come in-house, they won't be able to get you the visas if you don't have a degree in the thing that they're hiring you for. Um, other than that, I've never had anybody ask me about my credentials. I've not had anybody talk about my degree, ask me about my degree nor does it really come up in conversations. And a lot of job listings I see don't typically mention that you have to have a degree. What they wanna see is the work that you have the capabilities and you have the skill set. which is why when it was mentioned earlier, I think by Justin that having a breakdown of how you're able to actually create your pipeline is really important because that's what they want to see. So if you're very open and honest about how you're creating your models and showing your skill level, technical skill level on that level, I don't think the fact whether you're self-taught or you have a degree is really that much different, unless again, you want to work internationally. I think it's very important then. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I've been teaching for almost 15 years now, and everything you said was like to point. I mean, the nice thing that you added up was the, the visa part. That's not something that you know, I was even thinking about. But uh, I, I generally find, I mean, I know this is just like a high level thing. I feel like there's two types of students someone who goes to art school because they have no idea what they want to do. And they're kind of like, I'm going to sample the buffet line, see what these classes are like, trying to find my place. And maybe when I get done with school, I don't want a job, but I also kind of need to figure out, do I push this forward? And then there's the other part, but usually it's people who have done other schools or have done manual labor. And then, then they go to school, they know exactly what they want to do. And they're going to take full advantage of every single course. So I, I, I agree with what you just said too. It's like, School is beneficial if, if um, you need that extra push to be organized. You don't know the learning path to take. Um, but in a way, I feel like you really need to be able to self-teach because I have been out of college for a long time and I'm teaching myself every single year new software, new hardware, new pipeline techniques. Every single studio you go to, you have to learn how to interact with new people even if you're doing freelance or contract work, you're not there. You still have to learn how to interact with their pipeline. They're not, they're like um, accounting and financial plans. You're constantly learning. So I think the biggest skill set that you can have, I could care less if someone has a degree, if I'm being completely honest. I care less if I care more about are they good at communication? Are they passionate? Um, are they patient? Because if they are those three, I can teach them the software that they need to do. Obviously, I'm hoping that they have baseline understanding of the technology and have a really like decent uh, portfolio I can work from, but you're constantly learning in this industry. So it's not like I'm done. I don't have to worry about this again. You, you're always learning. So you have to be able to be constantly self-teaching and searching out, you know, things like the rookies, uh, things like the learning things that Autodesk offers, anything you find on, on YouTube, these networking events, um, like that stuff you need to always be trying to learn. But if I'm being completely blunt, I personally, as I'm hiring, I've never looked at someone's portfolio and been like, looks great, but you don't have a degree. Uh, it always comes down to, do I like their portfolio? Do I like them as a person? Because I have to trust you to a certain extent to financially invest myself and be like, hey, I hope, to, hope you're going to deliver because I have other people I have to answer to. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? Yeah, um, I completely agree with you guys. Um, Obviously, also myself, I can never look and see if a person has a degree if I'm looking to hire someone. But in terms of work and workflows and pipelines, it definitely can help somebody to have that basis in the fundamentals. Because if you're completely self-teaching, it's so difficult to know what you should actually be doing and the steps you should be taking in the process of the workflows. And I found so many people who, they have so much potential, but it takes them so long to get anywhere because they never had anyone actually giving them that guidance. So even if it's not a degree, I think it can be very helpful to do courses or have some sort of mentor or somebody who's helping to guide you because there are so many steps that are so easy to just miss out on because you've got nobody telling you that you need to be taking these steps in your workflow. So while it's not necessary, I, yeah, people don't often ask for degrees or your qualifications. I think it can be very helpful, especially if you are planning on, you know, getting somewhere in the, in the industry like fast, you know, it can take so many years just trying to find your footing in what you should be doing and how to achieve the end result that you're looking for. So I think that guidance with courses, even if it's just an online course or something like that, can be very helpful for you. I think I want to take one of the questions from the chat, actually. Um, it says, I'm a fresh graduate and I've been posting my work online for quite a while now. However, I could not gain an audience at all. And because of that, I'm very nervous about getting a job. Um, I would say that first off, we believe in you. Um, and second, audience does not denote self-worth. I uh, freelanced for about eight years doing all sorts of different things, but mainly 2D illustration and animation and um, gained a sizable following that definitely did not equate to money or jobs. It didn't hurt, but um, some of the most successful, uh, financially uh, successful artists that I know don't have a social media presence per se. So I would just like to get out ahead of that. Um, if anybody else has anything to add, feel, feel free though. 
Uh, yeah, I would have to say that having an audience doesn't equal having a presence. Like you don't, you don't have to have like hundreds of thousands of followers for people to know, for people in the key places to know who you are. Um, so yeah, like you said, I, I also know people who aren't online and are huge in terms of like internally in the industry, just because everybody knows what they do and what they do as well. Um, but also having a huge following doesn't equal being good at your job either. So like being present is just posting stuff and having um, your content out there. And by content, I just mean like just making the stuff that you'd like to make um, and people will know who you are, but you can have like hundreds of thousands of followers on something and still get no job requests. So I, I wouldn't say a presence equals audience at all. But in, in the same breath, I would say that what are you posting? Is it consistent? Is the quality of the system? Like um, nowadays, because there's such an influx of people trying to get jobs, there's a lot of jobs out there, but there's so many people trying to get jobs. So the, how do you stand out? And, you know, I've had this conversation with a bunch of other um, industry professionals and we've all kind of like mutually agreed that the way you stick out is you kind of have to have your own style. Uh, if that style is like, if you're like, if it's more like Pixar-ish or like realism, like Last of Us or whatever it is, that's your style. And you have to also have that subject matter because then it's like, oh man, this, this person always does uh, this amazing like prop stuff that's like Pixar style. Cool. I want, I, Cause then it's easier, easier to market yourself, easier for people to follow you, easier to really get like studios that are asking for that type of work. But yeah, I agree. I've seen people who have like hundreds of thousands of followers that have no work. And if I'm being honest, do, how do we know that they didn't pay for half those followers? I've seen friends, like not friends, but people, I've seen people that jump to all of a sudden, like having like 20 or 37 followers, a thousand. And then you look at the people who are actually liking the work and it's like low hundreds. And I'm like, well, look at the engagement. That's like 0.0005%. It's not good engagement. So the amount of followers, the amount of like, I wouldn't have like treat your, your social media on stuff. It's just like, it's another place to showcase your work. If you get work from it, that's awesome. But it shouldn't be the end all meal. Uh, and, and, but it, it takes patience. Like if you're fresh out of uh, out of school or if you're still new to the industry, I've I've seen people like one of my really good friends. Like it, he didn't have a job for five years after he graduated, and he's worked at a bunch of other studios since then. Now he's like higher up at one of like my favorite studios. He's like one of the leads there. But like, sometimes it's harder for certain people, and it just comes down to a variety of factors but you just have to be persistent and constant. And I think that's the biggest thing that people struggle with is being patient, persistent, and constant. Just, just quickly as well, because Balaj, you know, I, I don't know if people know his story, but essentially, I mean, you were self-taught, right? You actually studied, I think, law or whatever it was before that, you had a sort of past history. Um, you yeah, self-taught, you came through the work, rookies, your work was absolutely stunning. You, you're a really good, I think, model of somebody that's sort of, you know, gone through that self-taught route, uh, promoted your work online, been recognised by, you know, major companies overseas. And, you know, I think you, you, your story is, is pretty pretty amazing, mate. So I think you're, you're being very quiet in the corner, but um, you're a very good example of somebody that, you know, has, has followed that path of, of promoting your work online, being recognised. But, you know, your work speaks for itself, right? Your work is amazing and it's, you're not just out there, you know, dropping loads and loads of content. You're actually, it's quality work and it, and it has been noticed. So, yeah, just, just want to pay kudos to you, mate done a great job thanks <laughs> well I'm, I'm much appreciated i don't know what to say <laughs> thank you thanks that's very nice of you <laughs> i actually i actually wanted to just uh quickly add that i completely agree with uh, uh justin that style is uh style is crucial when it comes to uh, getting yourself noticed um, this is this is uh, so in my case this was uh, this was a very long process to even figure out what the scene is gonna be what the demo reel is gonna be about that uh, I'm gonna be making so that 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 was I think that process to finally just uh, 
get the idea solidified and uh, just making it clear in my mind, okay, this is, this is the scene that I want to do. I think the process of finding the idea took me even longer than making the whole thing afterwards. And uh, because I know that there are so many amazing works out there, but when you see like the, when you like see 50 post apocalyptic bonkers, one after another, all of them are amazing, but you just, the, the whole thing just feels like soulless and no style at all, even though it looks absolutely beautiful and it, uh, it makes it like it's jaw dropping and everything. It's just uh, less style. And when you see 50 of them, you're just going to distinguish one artist from, from another. Yeah, I mean, and, and, yeah, and, I, ju I just wanted to add this, like, uh, I just wanted to highlight this and emphasize because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely true. crucial. Yeah, what you, what you said is a great point because I feel like um, there's this impatience when it comes to not only learning software but creating content that I, I see a lot of people just rushing to get things done. But you look at actual productions mm -hmm. of any animation, game, visual effects, they have pre production, production, and post production. The pre production, you need to research and plan what you're going to make and why. If you go on like Art Station or the Rookies and you see like, oh man, all I'm seeing is like guns, cars, swords, all that stuff. How do you make something that sticks out? But it's also, it's not, I've seen people like run up and show us like huge, crazy scenes. And I'm like, that's amazing. Who's going to be looking at that? Not that it's no offense, like it's amazing. But the people that are looking at your work that might be hiring you for these freelancer contract jobs or just to get your stuff noticed, they have personal lives, they have full-time jobs, maybe even other jobs on top of that. Maybe they have a stack of people they're looking for. They're not going to look at this gigantic, huge world you created, and they're not going to be like, cool sword, 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 gun. Someone's going to be like, oh, this old school scale from the 1960s, that's awesome looking. And it's got this little like details on there. I'm going to stop and look at something that has a little bit of character that's presented nicely, that has a good pure ref reference board. And then like, I'll, I'll click on that guy's profile or girl's profile. And I'll just be like, oh, wow, they have just consistency. There's a great artist that I always look to, um, Juan Secure. He's been around since I was in college. And he just does amazing, simple props. He's in South America or Spain. I can't remember. But he has like this, his work is just subtle style props. And I love them. And with that, it shows that quality and consistency is key. But also, when you look at his work, it pops out. When you're looking at any art thread, his work pops out. The colors he used, the subject matter, it doesn't blend in. Like I have so many people who are like, I'm trying to be a character artist or I'm trying to be a character concept artist. Yeah, it's tough. Literally click on ArtStation, scroll through the main page. What do you see? 90% of it is characters, right? Even the rookies, all you see is a lot of it's characters. So how do you stand up so you you need to use that pre-production time to really research plan figure out what you're making and then that speeds up production and then when you get done with it do that post-production like ask yourself what did you learn um was it beneficial does it get you one step closer to what your end goal is um and what do you want to make next you know what i mean like i feel like you can't just if your goal is to get freelance and contract work you can't just be like I'm going to make whatever I want to make. There has to be some research and some like effort made to specifically showcase a skill that you have that the industry is looking for. That makes sense. Hopefully. So everyone, we're about time and we need to wrap up. Um, before we go, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for joining the panel. Um, and I hope our audience uh, got some great insights from these talented artists. So um Maybe in like a short phrase, what is like some quick advice you can like last second advice you can give to people just starting out? I think having a healthy work life balance requires managing our personal and professional lives so that they don't affect our physical or mental health. To get there, you should track your life, see what is important make a list in terms of priorities, set time for each item, uh, set goals and uh, make a step-by-step -step schedule to achieve them, take care of your health and spend time with your family, loved ones, at least have some, at least 30 minutes per day, spend time for yourself, no stress after work. And uh, after finishing your job, try not to think about anything 
like related to work. And I believe that with a good schedule, this is easy because you know that everything has its own time and place. And it's going to be helpful to have a life balance and enjoy your life while still having a successful freelance career. Amen. <laughs> what a lovely and don't, and, don't, and don't try to rush it. <laughs> because I think, I think a ton of people are looking for motivation, but uh, in in most cases, I think it's not motivation that they lack, but clarity. Like you need to have a specific goal on what you want to achieve, and then you will find a way to get there. And yeah, and just don't try to rush it. What we just talked about with uh, what Justin, as we just mentioned, it's just people just trying to rush it and just trying to pump out uh, the work all the time. But uh, it's really about if you if you make one piece that uh, leaves a mark on the internet, then that's it. Yeah, I, I'd say like, yeah, the goal oh, sorry, would be just, but it'd be kind of like what you actually just both said, having that life balance, but also make sure you're doing this for a reason uh, and do it for the right reasons. If you're doing it to try to get rich or to work yourself to death, it's not good. Um, and like, if you're looking for that flexibility so you can travel, like, so ask yourself, why do you want to freelance as opposed to be full-time? Um, and maybe that, that is you want to freelance a contract because you can't get full-time yet and you're hoping to get a full-time job. Cool. As long as you have that goal and you can plan backwards from that um, and really being honest with yourself why you want to do this lifestyle, because just like full-time, there's pros and cons, just like freelance, there's pros and cons. Um, there's going to be times where you get a lot of work. How do you balance that? while still giving the quality and attention so that way you don't bury yourself. And there's gonna be times where you have no work. How do you make sure that you're planning financially so that way you're not burning through your finances, being stressed? So as long as you kind of like, you do your research and weather the storm and have that life balance, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. And I'll, I'll just, I'll add to that, Jay, I'll just, you know, like, Everybody should contact Justin because he freelances. So anyone, <laughs> anyone wants any insights and in, you know into how to freelance, I think uh, he's, he's a good point of contact. But you're right; you're absolutely right. You, you've got to want to freelance as well. It's not for everybody. Some people enjoy that work environment, um, and I think you know for me, it's just you know enjoy it. If you're not enjoying freelancing, you know, just it, it's a hard gig. It's not for everybody because. You know, there are a lot of aspects outside of the creative part that you have to manage and not everyone can do that and not everyone wants to do that. So I think that's great advice, Justin, but feel free to reach out to Justin. He's very approachable. I, I just want to say one thing before someone, 80% of the freelance gigs that I've ever had, most of them fall through. So be prepared to be prepared to have a lot of the projects that you're trying to do. Even these really amazing ones, they might just fill, fizzle out. So you know, just because someone says you're getting the contract, there's nothing that says even I've had a contract up to the day where I had everything planned. Just so be prepared. Robin, do you have any closing uh, advice? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, Maybe. Okay. Um, I would say probably one of the most important things is don't let yourself get stagnant. I think a lot of the time people get very comfortable at their skill level and with what they're comfortable doing and they don't really set their sights on progressing further than that really. So, I mean, it's fine to be comfortable, but it's a very competitive industry and things are changing all the time. So it's just good to always have that mindset of always improving and always, you know, learning new software and staying competitive within the industry. Otherwise, you're just going to fall behind really. Sorry if that sounds like harsh, but it's kind of a reality. Oh, it's great advice. Shailene? Oh, um, gosh, I guess the biggest thing, like I, I agree with Sarah the, the most, it's you need to learn to say no and set very clear boundaries with your clients and not to feel bad about that, um, to, uh 
as I, I'm, I'm sorry to bring it up, but especially being a woman in the industry, it can feel very difficult to be able to clearly say, this is my boundary and I won't cross it. And, you know, without the fear of coming across as that person. Um, so I think don't be afraid to say no to things. Don't be afraid to say it's six o'clock. I don't work past six o'clock. I'm not going to reply to your email at 11 p.m. That's a clear boundary to have with clients as well. Um, and then to add on what I think Justin was saying is that out of 10 emails I may get in my inbox, only one of them will be a legit job. Um, so try not to get too excited if you're getting a lot of um, work requests. Sometimes simply just saying what your rate is will like cut out like 50, 60% of them. So just try to be relaxed, make sure you ask your clients as many questions as possible to get as much information as possible. Um, and just have that work-life balance and set clear boundaries. Um, Cause the best clients do respect them and don't ever cross them. So if you have clients who regularly try to cross those boundaries, then you know not to work with them again. Um, so don't feel bad about doing those things because ultimately you're there to help them. Um, they're not doing you a favor. You know, you're, you're there to help them and provide a service for them. So setting a boundary isn't you being a bad person. Um, but that's probably the only thing that I have to add. Thank you, everyone. Um, to everyone in the audience, good luck on starting your freelance career. Bye. Good luck. Bye. See you guys. Bye bye. Rest of the week.